Yeah, I'm just trying to work out who was on that Future of Local Government review uh, that was published on Friday. Um, and is going to generate, I can tell you, an awful lot of upset. Um, they called the review into local government, a uh, review into the future for local government. Interestingly, there's a whole series of bu- bullet holes through the future for, I don't, it's obviously design quirk, but mm, you could take it as a bit more than that, I think. But it would be interesting and um, it would be interesting to see who was actually on it, the membership of, um, of that review. I, they were all appointed by the government, of course they were, and um, they are, here we go, Jim Palmer, oh good God, Jim Palmer, uh, Penny Hulse, who I think was a Labour Party deputy mayor for Auckland, people you've never heard of, Antoine Coffin, uh, Gail Surgener. Brendan Boyle. Um, they were the five representatives that were appointed by Nanaya Mahuta. Um, I don't know what their backgrounds are. Oh, well, I can tell you, actually. Antoine Coffin is currently a director or a consultant at Te Onawa Consultants. This will be the best job he's ever had, which offers specialist advice to government, local government and corporate clients in the areas of strategic planning Resource Management Act and building relationships with Tangata Whenua. Mr. Coffin has 25 years experience in Maori resource management. Oh, and he's been a Crown appointed Freshwater Commissioner. It just gets better. Uh, Gail Surgener had le- held senior leadership roles at the Auckland Council. She was the General Manager of Community and Social Innovation. Okay, so she's a bureaucrat, works in local government. Brendan Boyle, ah uh, yes, he's Mr. Fixit. Uh, he was Chief Executive Department of Internal Affairs. He was also the Secretary for Local Government um, and the Chief Executive of the Ministry for Social Development. So he's a bureaucrat uh, and he's made his life as a bureaucrat. Penny Hulsa was on the Kainga Ora Urban Development Committee she was the first deputy mayor of the newly appointed Auckland. That's right. And she was a deputy mayor of Waitakere uh, prior to that. And then Jim Palmer, oh, retired chief executive of the Waimakariri District Council um, after 17 years in that role. So he is a technocrat as well. So that was that's the five people that made up the review panel. Uh, with the exception of Holser, none of them. Uh, have elected member experience. Um, three of them are bureaucrats. And one of them is, I guess, the Maori voice. Uh, and that's it. So they're the ones that have come up with this proposal. Um, yes. So they were appointed by Nanaya Mahuta to this particular role. All right. So that's the thing. Uh, so we're going to be talking, in actual fact, to Peter Williams about this. Um, on Friday afternoon, a message went out from Peter. Now, Peter is, I think he is a board member of the New Zealand Taxpayers Union uh, and obviously a former broadcaster and indeed, I think he ended up as a Magic FM radio host. But he actually now lives down here in central Otago. I think he lives in Terrace from memory. Everybody, it's, it's, it's amazing the number of mayors, ex-mayors, broadcasters and everything that you meet down in central Otago and that live down here in the lakes or central Otago. is just incredible. And Peter Williams is the latest one. Can I say, I think a lot of people would say that they come for the beauty. I actually think they come for the culture just quietly. Uh, and when I mean the culture, I think they come to this place because it reminds them, oh, well, ask Peter himself, it reminds them of what New Zealand used to be or maybe could have been, um, but we chose a separate path. I don't know. But anyhow, he joins us now, um, and we'll start asking that question direct. Peter, why did you come down here in the end? What was what was it attracted you to 
retire or live down in central Otago in the lakes? Uh, because, Michael, I'm a southern man at heart. I know it's an old cliche from the state said, but I was born in South Canterbury. My father, like yours, was a school teacher, so we moved around a bit. I spent my primary school years in Southlands, firstly just out of Invercargill, out of the city itself. When I was in Form 2, we shifted to uh, Omaroon. I went to Waitaki Boys High School, where I think your old man became the rector soon after I left. Uh, so... I'm uh, I'm a southern man. I, I spent the vast majority of my adolescent life south of the Waitaki River, very proud of it. And I just thought that when I stop working, I'll come back to where I came from. No, and I spent 40, 42 years in the North Island and came back south last year. Um, one of the things I've been mentioning was the number of people who, particularly prominent in public life, who seem to have retired to this nick of the woods um, over the last five, ten years. Um, I, you've, you've got a connection. I don't know if some of the others have the same connection as you do. Do you think there's a sep- another a distinct culture down here, Peter, in comparison with other places in New Zealand? Uh, undoubtedly. I just heard you before talking about roads and about how these roads are dangerous. Well, Michael, I live just out of the town that you live in, just out of Cromwell, and State Highway 8, which is effectively the main road between... Christchurch and Queenstown, it goes more or less past my front gate. State Highway 8 is a beautiful road. It has trucks and buses on it all the time, but it's in perfectly good condition and I can drive safely on it at 105 kilometres per hour and don't feel in the slightest threatened. So, yeah, we have we have uh, roads in this part of the country that are way better. I was in the North Island uh, for my sins where the week before last. I was in Christchurch last week for other reasons as well. And the further north you go, my God, the quality of the transport infrastructure just gets worse and worse. So we're very lucky in that respect down here. Although having said that, I'm in Cromwell at the moment, Michael, doing a few things. And my God, it's a mess here, isn't it? Yeah, it What's is. What's that carry yeah. on up to the roundabout? You mm. know, it's well, it should be finished by the end of the decade, I'd like to think. But then they said that about an overbridge in Tauranga as well, and it's still going on. Uh, the end of the year, they're promising now, Peter. But uh, Give me the break. Give yeah. me a break. We'll see. Um, but that's what happened. Hey, um, yeah. the, the reason I've got you on the show is that you've got another hat, though, that you wear, and you, you wear it well. You're a board member of the New Zealand Taxpayers Union. Um, I guess before I talk to you about the issue we're going to talk about, just explain, what is the New Zealand Taxpayers Union? Well, I suppose in crude terms, you call it a lobby group, an activist group that was set up uh, which I often remind lefties, it was set up during the years of the John Key government in 2013. Uh, a couple of well-known uh, young national activists, David Farrer and Jordan Williams, were getting frustrated with what they saw was not always the wisest use of taxpayers' money. So they set up this group to, to use the old uh, phrase, keep the bastards honest. So it's been a group, a ginger group, an activist group, a lobby group, call it what you want, which just likes to point out sometimes the sheer stupidity of both central government and local government spending. And it's been looking for campaigns for the 10 years, last 10 years. It gets its money from its donors, most of whom, despite what the lefties want to say, are small uh, small donors, uh, most people who are on the mailing list and contribute to uh, the taxpayers' union pay $100 here, $500 there. I mean, it's not funded by big business or some nasty corporates, as, again, the lefties want to tell you. It is very much a voice of the people. Uh, when it comes to causes, though, God, since 2020, frankly, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. There is just so much to aim your, uh, to, to take your aim at for the, the, the wasteful government spending. So it's a very, uh, it's a very busy organisation which has now got uh, you know, a very, very large database and many generous uh, donors. And staff is growing, the campaigns are getting more and more prevalent all the time. So it's a very busy organisation and Jordan Williams, I think, leads it brilliantly as the, uh, the face of it. And we've just recruited a new campaign manager, Callum Purvis, a uh, young Scotsman who's coming to take over the role that Louis Holbrook had before. So these guys go really well. Um, what's your full-time staff now? <sighs> to be honest, I'm a board member and I don't know, but I think it's uh, around about half a dozen. 
Mm. And there's interns on top of that as well. Yeah. Uh, some young people, university students and the like, work in there on a, on a part-time, sometimes paid, sometimes voluntary basis. Because uh, there are, despite what many would tell you, there are some young people who think politically to the right, Michael. Uh, they're not all raging lefties after all. No, in actual fact, they're not. I can t- tell you that from my daughter and her associates. Uh, they're certainly not liberals. Um, now, can I ask, though, um, to do with this, You on Friday afternoon, you would have seen the Local Government Review come out, or the Future of Local Government Review panel, um, this group of, um, of experts uh, who I've just gone through the membership of, and uh, they aren't experts at all, they're just technocrats. Um, and they've come up with these recommendations what are the things that particularly upset you? Well, the thing that gets me the most is the, the loss of democracy uh, because you're taking away the, the, the concept of one person, one vote, every vote being of equal status. And I've just heard you outlining that. Now, put that alongside this uh, compulsorily uh, uh, putting in place STV, the single transferable vote, preferential vote, which I just think is a nonsense, nonsense way of voting. They do it in Australia, I know. Uh, some local authorities do it in this country. It led to the situation in Dunedin in 2019, didn't it, where Lee Vandervis was the, the top polling candidate, but he didn't win the mayoralty because of all the preferential votes that put Aaron Hawkins in, 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 into the big chair with the change. So I think STV is a, is a nonsensical way of voting. Surely one person, one vote, and the person with the most votes wins. It's the way that I've always thought democracy should go. So STV, uh, I think, is a silly idea. As for giving the vote to 16-year-olds, well, hell, why don't go the whole way and just say, if you're five, once you've started school and you're starting to be indoctrinated by the lefty school teachers these days, give five-year-olds the vote. Why piss around with uh, 16? Just make it open slather. Anybody can vote. And then the kids can be told how to vote by their teachers and their parents. I mean, it, it, it's just a ridiculous recommendation. Uh, when I was growing up 21 was the voting age it dropped to 20 then to 18 they're all arbitrary numbers when do you become a mature adult apparently not until the age of 25 so there might be a good case actually for making the voting age 25 but to make it 16 is well okay it's it's just a a number that's frankly been plucked from a hat Uh, you can leave school at 15 still can't you or do you have to be 16 I don't know Uh, 17 17 now it's a stupid number, mm. and like I say, if you're going to make it 16, uh, just make it. Um, well, let's give everybody the vote. Call it, call it universal suffrage, kids and all. Uh, we'll have family packages as well. The um, in the executive summary or in the introduction to the report that was released on Friday, there is uh, a, a case made right at the start saying that significant change is needed. Uh, and that this review provides a significant once-in-a-generation opportunity for us us all to reimagine our future and think about how the local government should evolve. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the hell does that mean? uh, Well, uh, essentially it means um, we think that what we're doing is historic and important. (laughs) Um, And this is how historic and important we are. Um, But having said that, what I thought was interesting was... It starts with that vision. Did you read that bit where it says what their vision is? And it talks about a Harakiki bush. (laughs) Did you read that? No, no, of course not. I I just read the executive summary. Uh, The the executive summary and the bullet points are really all I need to know. Everything else is just window dressing and a bit of fluff, frankly. Uh, it's, It's ridiculous stuff, but it's just so typical of what comes out of the Wellington bureaucracy these days. I mean, as far as local government's concerned, Michael, and I know that you've had a long involvement in local government, I've always thought local government should concentrate on the three R's. Uh, The three R's being rates, rubbish and votes. And you don't need to worry about anything else. Make sure that your rates are collected at an appropriate uh, level that everybody can afford, that you collect the rubbish and that you look after the roads. Uh, that uh, the local authority is responsible for. Of course, the great irony is, Michael, where I live in the country in central Otago now, I don't get my rubbish collected. No, you don't. And I live down a dirt road. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what the hell do I pay What do you pay your rates for? Yeah, I think every rural rate pass is that. Yeah, and I don't even have a 
South Wales you know, Council organised water supply either. We have our own private water bore, uh, which thankfully comes out of the very pure Clutha River. So, yeah, I, I really wonder why I, why I bother paying rates because I frankly don't get anything for it unless I want to spend hours in the Cromwell Library, which I've got, with all due respect to the nice people around the Cromwell Library, I, I, I have better things to do. Mm. Um, well, the next one, though, is... But, but I think the key thing here is the Tariti-based partnership and local government. Um, and <laughs> is this apartheid? Uh, well, I'd just like to know whereabouts in the three articles and the preamble of the Treaty of Waitangi local government was ever mentioned. I mean, we had this decision by Sir Robin Cook in the Court of Appeal back in 1987 where, unfortunately, uh, Justice Cook uh, put in this phrase about it being akin, the treaty being akin to a partnership. And my God, have the Maori activists picked up that phrase and run with it. They dropped the, the, the uh, words akin to. They've just said the treaty is now a partnership. And then they've started to essentially reinvent the treaty over the last 35 years. The pace of that reinvention has just hit, uh, you know, warp factor 10 uh, since the re-election of the Ardern government in 2020. And you've had uh, Willie Jackson and Nanaia Mahuta being uh, the tail that's been wagging the government's, uh, the government's dog through the, uh, through the Maori caucus. So essentially all these phrases that have crept into the modern vernacular, Matarangi Māori, Tao Māori, Tikanga Māori. What do they actually mean? How can they be defined? And I've spoke to legal academics about this, particularly conservative ones, and James Allen's one that you've had on your show, the former uh, lecturer at Otago University, now in Queensland, a Canadian, a very a knowledgeable man on, on the law in Commonwealth countries. Uh, I've spoken with David Round, former law professor who taught my son and daughter-in-law at uh, Canterbury University, and he just asked the questions, what are these things? And, and you ask the, the people, uh, ask these legal a- academics, what is te ao Māori? What is mataranga Māori? What is tikanga Māori? And the answer seems to be from these learned men, um, it's whatever you want it to be. You make it up. Mm. And I'm afraid there's way too much making up of stuff as we go along and, and go down this particular uh, path towards uh, Maori, well, I'd say Maori control, because you can call it co-governance if you want to. As we saw just last week with Toyota Weta, co-governance is a complete crook. I mean, the, the re- reality is in, in, in Toyota Weta, which used to be a national park owned by all New Zealanders and run by the Department of Conservation, uh, it's now run by Tuhoi. So what are Tuhoi doing? They're ripping down all the, all the huts that you and I as taxpayers that the Department of Conservation own. Now, some of them might be in some state of disrepair. I'm told, I've heard that some of those huts are in very good condition and cost an awful lot of money to build just in the last four or five years. But there's, what, 44 huts being ripped down because two always say so and because the Department of Conservation uh, just don't have the guts to stand up to them. So it's not co-governance. Two are proving that it's uh, the, the Murray way or, or no way uh, at all. It's, it's the Murray, uh, the, the, the Murray uh, decision and nobody else gets a look in. And we're going to see that pretty soon with three waters, if, that's come, if that comes to pass as well. And now it looks as if we're going to have uh, the same sort of uh, path uh, having us uh, laid out before us for, for local government as well. So I think it's a very, very dangerous direction that the country is being taken in uh, by the likes of Nanaya Mahuta and Willie Jackson. You can call me racist and, and, and the like if you, if you want to. Well, frankly, I've been called far worse things. What is, what's the, the dictionary definition of a racist, Michael? The, the Oxford Dictionary says a racist is somebody who believes that one particular ethnicity or one race is of uh, a lower class or is inferior to another. Well, I don't believe uh, in the slightest that uh, Maori or Pacific or Japanese or Chinese are inferior to me as a Pākehā. But what I'm seeing in this legislation and these draft reports is that Maori believe that Pākehā are inferior to them because they want to run the show. 
So that's um, that's that's the biggest uh, fear that I have that we are being taken in a direction that is inherently racist, and the racism is being driven by uh, the, the sickly white liberals, as Mr. Peters used to call them, and by the the Nanaya Mahoudas and the Willie Jacksons of this world. Um, going back, one of the things you talked about was you wanted local government to go back to basics. Um, this local government review says exactly the opposite. It says in actual fact that, um, lo- I'll read it to you, well, you've probably read it yourself. Um, councils should focus on holistic strategies to improve the well-being of their communities, and this is one of the five key shifts that they want. Um, I guess there'll be a debate about that, and that's what all this is about. But as I'm looking here, Peter, um, I'm struggling to see anything that solves the real problem. Is this, and you've you alluded it to at the front of your conversation, and that is how much money you're paying for the rates and how little services you're receiving for them. Yes, well, the, the things that I needed in terms of holistic services from my local council are to have my dirt roads at the very least graded on a regular basis if not sealed, and it's only about a kilometre long, for God's sake, and it would be nice if maybe some Central Ontario District Council rubbish trucks would come out there and pick up my wheelie bin every now and then, but I know that's never going to happen, so I have to bring it into the Cromwell dump and pay $8 for it. So it's actually pretty cheap dumping. But, but frankly, what do you really want from your local council? Uh, when you were in, in, uh, in Wanganui, Michael, did, did you believe it was absolutely important that you had... Uh, art galleries that you promoted Wanganui uh, to visitors? Did you spend much on tourism initiatives? Did you believe that uh, the, uh, the the local library and the local swimming pool should be kept up and that they should run a profit? Well, probably not, but then there are some things that come under the headline of a public good. An art gallery may or may not come under that. Libraries and swimming pools most certainly do. So do parks and reserves and sports fields, whether or not uh, huge half-billion-dollar stadiums do is, is a moot point and will be debated long and hard. I guess, but that, that's for, I, I, I guess the answer to that question is that's for the local community to democratically yeah, decide, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so I just believe that councils really should do, you know, if they want to offer holistic services, just keep my roads in good condition, pick up my rubbish or at least make, the ability for me to dump my rubbish uh, easy uh, and not have the dump uh, closed until 10 o'clock every morning. Mm. Um, <laughs> what the, the really interesting, you, there's a bit in here that I thought you'd love, but you probably didn't read, but it's okay, I'll share it with you now. It's just one paragraph. <laughs> this is talking about the panel, and it says, and it might explain everything that came out in the report, Peter. It's, it says, this is one paragraph, the panel's journey... Can you believe this? This is the five people. <laughs> and it says, as, as we have embarked on the journey over the past 18 months, the panel has realised that notwithstanding our collective experience, we've had more opportunities to listen to, to learn and unlearn and understand more deeply. Te Tiriti o Waitangi and the Papa of local government Māori relations. And then it goes on to say... The system needs to ensure a more meaningful expression of rangatiratanga and a more culturally specific exercise of kawanatanga by councils with te ao Māori values reflected at all levels of the system. I guess that's the end of it really, isn't it? Yeah, God spare us. So what does that mean, Michael? What, what, is, what is rangatiratanga? Uh, a rangatira is a chief. Yep. Rangatira Tanga therefore means the decision of the chief. Doesn't sound like there's too much democracy in Rangatira Tanga, just saying. Uh, Kawana Tanga, well, that's government. By the way, you know, we don't have a government of New Zealand now. That's just a, a little underline under the main headline of uh, government correspondence because we're now Ke Te Kawa, ke te kawana kawana o, tanga. Yeah. tanga of Aotearoa. That's the government of New Zealand. Um, uh, um, and, and then what is what, what is Tao Māori? What is the Māori worldview? I don't what know. I, I asked uh, that question this morning. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, does Paul Bennett have the same Māori worldview exactly. as yeah. Willie Jackson? Yeah, obviously. that's right. Yeah. Does Simon Bridges think the same as Nanaya Mahuta? Obviously not. I mean, it's, it's frankly, Michael, it's bollocks. Mm. Uh, absolutely. No, I, I asked that question uh, a couple of hours ago. I said, yeah. Yeah. T- t- and, and, but 
the idea that there is a Maori worldview, I think, to be perfectly honest with you, is as much a construct of white liberals in Wellington as it is of anybody else. I mean, you and I know that if you were to say, well, what, okay, so what's the white Pākehā view of New Zealand? The answer to that question would be, well, where would you start? Because there would be so many. Um, and that would be exactly true of Māori. This, this, this racism, it seems, that Māori all think the same way. Of course they don't, as you've just pointed out. Yeah, and luckily we have some Maori politicians who occasionally make some noise about it. I'm I'm uh, pleased to to see that Seymour, who does what's the word fuck a papa back to Napui uh, on his mother's side apparently, has a decent uh, lineage from from Napui. Uh, Winston Peters the same. At least they are prepared to put their head above the parapet and say this is nonsense. Uh, Seymour's obviously going to be an influential part of any right-leaning or centre-right government that may or may not happen after next year. Whether or not Winston is as well, I don't know. Uh, I see that Horizon poll this morning has got him at 6.5%. I treat uh, Horizon polls with deep scepticism because they don't actually ring random people. They're just uh, people... It's a panel kind of poll, so there's not too much credibility attached to that anymore. And Obviously, it's been leaked to stuff because it favours the Labour Party. So I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. In the proper polls, the, the random polls, New Zealand First is battling sort of the 1%, 2%. Uh, but you would like to think that uh, Seymour would certainly push the case with the very unfortunately woke Christopher Luxon to make national or, or a, a centre-right government just a bit more hard-nosed on this issue and to stop um, stop the 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 bullshit that's coming out and, and let's just uh, get back to a bit of hard-nosed reality that people in this country want. I mean, maybe I've got it all wrong. Maybe you and I, Michael, are just of a generation where it's uh, it's changed and we're always afraid of change when you get into your mid to late, late 60s. If they actually went to a referendum as Seymour proposes, what might be the outcome of it? I, don't, I mean, who knows? The majority might win. It's the same as if you have a uh, a, a referendum on whether or not New Zealand could be called Aotearoa. Maybe, uh, maybe the other side would win. I have my doubts, but it might. No, uh, I, I, but, let's, I, yeah, but, but let's just find out. Well, I mean, and, and that's the issue. I mean, if you are going to have a democracy, let, let there be democratic ways in which you choose your future. Yeah. Um, Peter, thank you very much for joining us this morning. I really appreciate your time. Um, where are you going with this campaign, by the way? You've um, sent out a newsletter to all your members. I take it that this yep. will be um, this particular review um, mm. will be a particular priority of your organisation over the next wee while? Uh, it, absolutely. The Taxpayers Union are going to... The, the, the funds have started to roll in and we're very thankful to that. So to every Taxpayer Union member who has donated so far, we really, really appreciate uh, your support. Uh, the campaign team in Wellington and Auckland under... Jordan Williams and Callum Purvis will be uh, getting together ways and means of, of putting the word around because once again, of course, we find the, our friends in the mainstream media just utterly uh, missing in action. Yes, sir. I saw some. Yeah. I, I saw some coverage of this thing on Friday night, and for God's sake, here is a, an absolute, outright, full-faced affront, frontal attack on the very concept of democracy. And what's the stuff headline about? Panel recommends voting age lower to 16. I mean, for God's sake, can they not see what the important, what the important aspect of this report is? No, don't want to worry about that because, after all, we took all that money from the Public Interest Journalism Fund, which paid us $55 million, and we have to uh, uh, abide by the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi and uh, actively promote the principles of partnership and participation under the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. So they are playing by the rules of getting that money, but it's a media which is uh, bought and paid for, and it's frankly disgraceful that it's going on. But there you go. That's the world we live in, and that's why the Taxpayers' Union has got to stand up and fight the good fight. Mm. OK. All right. Thank you, Peter. Nice to have you on the show. We'll talk again soon and review progress. That's Peter Williams, um, board member of the Taxpayers' Union. It's coming up to 12 o'clock. Just before I go, though, to the news and sport and weather at 12, uh, I just want to read you a little bit again from this local government review. And it's, if you want 
you think what Peter said is disturbing, it isn't as disturbing as the report itself. You won't have seen it reported anywhere else. I've reviewed before I did the show today what was being reported in the mainstream media to do with this local government review. And I guess at heart you probably think, oh, it's boring, it's local government too. No, 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 it's much more important than that. If it was just about local government, you could go safely back to sleep. Um, at one stage in the report, and it's on page 77, if you want to know, so there you are, it's buried deep in a 200-page report. Um, it quotes the Māori, uh, Te Pāti Māori MP, Debbie uh, Narewa Packer, um, and on her, and expresses support expresses support for her view on the um, Naitahu bill that appointed mana whenua representatives to the Environment Canterbury, the Canterbury Regional Council. And it quotes her directly, um, and I'll read the quote in a second, but it quotes her approvingly and supports what she says and what she says is this it is absolutely archaic to believe that te tariti is proportionate in other words it's archaic to believe that there's some sort of proportion and partnership which is ironically what the court of appeal decided this amendment, this is the amendment to the local electoral bill, is a good step towards embodying Te Tiriti o Waitangi at a local level and returning the balance of power to mana whenua. Okay, I'll say this to you again. This amendment is a good step today towards embodying Te Tiriti o Waitangi at a local level and returning the balance of power to mana whenua. However, it does not guarantee Māori representation or necessarily restore any mana whenua rights, so it must be seen as a first step only in returning pa power to tangata whenua to their rohe, which means the area, or crossing that bridge. It should be mandatory on councils or at least mandatory to have mana whenua reps, and then it endorses that. The key here is mana whenua reps is only the first step according to Debbie Narewa Packer to returning the balance of power to mana whenua the balance of power to mana whenua and that was a view given great moment in this report and endorsed <laughs> 